Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mama Wears Athleisure. I am your host, Mariella de Santiago, a first time mom. We focus on all things mom with tips to help make life easier and more organized for all you mamas out there. Hi, everyone. So today we have Shana Shockett, and we're going to talk about relationships or love after babies. So I have been trying to get Shana on here for like the last year. So I'm really excited that she's finally on here and was able to squeeze us in. Thank you so much for having me on. And I know it's been about a year. You contacted me originally when my now 13 or almost 14 month old is was just born or was just about to be born and just life got crazy. And we kept having little catch-ups like, Hey, we're going to do it now. And then just never panned out. So here we are. Finally, I am a mom of three, two girls, one boy. I'm a licensed therapist, Gottman bringing baby home educator and the face behind love after baby, where I share tips for moms to work on their relationships after having kids. And I kind of fell into this when I was pregnant with my second because obviously when I had my first baby, there were challenges and in my head, I was like, okay, all relationships have things they need to work through. All relationships have growing pains at times and getting to know each other and figuring out differences. And I never like thought about it in terms of the kid piece. And then when I was pregnant with my second, I was working in private practice and had all these different mom clients who are struggling with anxiety or life transitions of things changing and figuring it out. And one of the things that I started noticing was how people's relationships changed when they had babies. And I saw this with one mom whose kids were going off to college and she was about to enter, enter empty nest syndrome. And she was trying to figure out what to do with her life once she got to this stage. And in the course of our discussions, it came up that she's kind of nervous of what life's going to look like between her and her husband once her kids leave the house, because for the past 20 years, everything's been about the kids. And it was almost like she was living with a stranger. And so she was somebody who was on the end of this journey, whereas I had another client who just had her first child and suddenly was having different like issues of resentment and other things in her relationship that she never experienced before. And she's like, I can't understand why me and my husband are having these disagreements and arguments and resentment. And we never had this before. And then I had another client who had one child struggled to get pregnant with that one child. And now that that child was getting a little bit older, was thinking about having a second. And one of the things she said was my husband and I are finally in such a good place now. I'm not sure if I'm willing to like rock the boat and go back there and like get pregnant again and go through that baby stage again. And it was really trying on our relationship and on my mental health. And they suddenly had this like click of this correlation of the changes that relationships go through when you have a child. And I saw this like person who's at the beginning of it and this person who's at the end of it. And like somebody has to come here at ideally the beginning stages, but at least at the middle to help this couple prevent from getting to the point where their kids are leaving to college and they feel like strangers. Wow. That is, that's pretty amazing because yes, so much changes. Well, and on top of having a baby, you as a mother are going through all of these changes, both physically, mentally, emotionally. So it's such a challenge to figure out one, the time to how you continue to work on this relationship that yeah you love obviously right you're with your partner because you want to be right I tell them like clearly you chose to start a family with each other because you wanted to spend your life with this person and then unfortunately somewhere along the way like you love your child now and that's the way it should be like you should love your child but why are you feeling like you're not in love with your partner anymore who you chose to have this child with how can we fix that Was it normal to struggle in a romantic relationship after you have a baby? Yes. I would say that 99% or a hundred percent of relationships are affected by having a kid. They can't not be. So like, even if you have a really great relationship, there's still going to be things that come up related to having a kid that wouldn't be a dynamic in your relationship if you didn't have a kid. But in terms of really struggling, Statistics show that 67% of new parents within the first three years of having a baby have decreased relationship satisfaction. So this is based on a Gottman research statistic, and they like to call the masters and the disasters. So masters are people who 
navigate relationship challenges in a productive, constructive, healthy way. And disasters are the people who, you know, fall into these really bad patterns and habits and relationships and don't know how to deal with different things that come up and end up using things like the four horsemen, like resentment, sorry, he calls it contempt, but criticism, defensiveness, contempt, stonewalling, all those different things. So it's not that the masters never have challenges in their relationships. It's just that they navigate them differently. Oh my goodness. It it totally makes you kind of sit back and reflect on your relationship about like, okay, well, where do you see that? So how are the romantic relationships affected then after you have a baby? There's so many things that just kind of come to mind. Like for me, I automatically think, well, you're sleep deprived, like (laughs) you're trying to just survive. Yeah. So sleep deprivation is literally a torture tactic, right? And when we have a baby, it's a beautiful thing, but we're still physically experiencing that lack of sleep that our body needs. So it's kind of like sleep helps our body recharge, right? We rest, it allows us to recharge. So if you have your iPhone and the battery dies and you don't plug it into the charger as much as you want to use this phone. And if the phone wanted to be used, let's say, if it's not put in the charger, it's not going to function. So when we have a baby, especially in the beginning stages and, you know, three kids, and I've definitely experienced this, especially in the beginning, we're like running on adrenaline. Those first few nights, you just kind of, and that's how your body helps you function in the beginning. So you're running on adrenaline, you just get through it and you're even less sleep than at home. Cause when you, if you birth in a hospital, they're literally in there like every hour, like doing blood pressure, this, that, the other, they like, you finally fall asleep and they don't let you sleep. So we're really (laughs) sleep deprived, but in those first few days, our body's still like recovering and it more catches up with you once you're back at home and like recuperating and suddenly you're alone, especially for people who don't have family to come help them. If their partner works and doesn't have leave from work to come help them, if they can't afford to get a nanny or a night nurse or whatever it is, and then suddenly everything just catches up with you and you're really overwhelmed and it's really hard. And we are more snappy when we're tired. And when we're tired, that also disrupts many other things in our body, such as like our appetite. So we might be wanting to eat everything and then feel uncomfortable, or we might have lack of appetite and then not eat enough. And I know with my first kid, the first time I put something in my mouth for the day was by like one in the afternoon, if, because I would wake up in the morning and then she would nurse and I'd be so tired that like I'd fall back asleep when she fell back asleep. So when she would wake up for her second nurse of the day, that's when I'd be like, okay, let me nurse her. And then I would shower and then I would get dressed. And then like I wanted to feel like a human being. And then by the time I made it into the kitchen, just to make a cup of coffee, it was already one in the afternoon. And so when we're not sleeping and then it goes into other things and then we're not eating properly and that affects us too. I mean, hangry is a very real word. And then there is lack of time. You suddenly have less time for yourself, for your relationship. There's a lack of what I would call freedom. And it's not in a I love being a mom. I was just away now for a few days and my husband encouraged me to go myself because I was going internationally for a few days for a family event and to go with all our kids just for a few days would be completely crazy because they're young and they would just be off schedule and they wouldn't enjoy it and we wouldn't enjoy it. So I was going to go myself with our one-year-old and then he encouraged me to leave our one-year-old at home and just enjoy it. So I was very anxious about it. And my stomach was turning, especially in like the days leading up to the trip. And then my sister who has a bunch more kids than I do is like, she's done this before. She's like, you're going to see the first couple hours or the first few hours of your flight. You're still going to be a little anxious. And then suddenly you're just going to feel relaxed and then you're going to even enjoy it. And you're like, not going to know to do with all your freedom. And now coming back from the weekend, I'm like, it was such a weird feeling of being free. Like Anytime I wanted to leave the hotel or go do something, I didn't have to tell anyone where I was going. I didn't have to think about like when I was going to be back. I didn't have to think about how long I was going to be. I didn't have to think about anything. I would just be able to be completely independent and just do what I wanted. And of course, like I feel grateful like I have a family at home. I wouldn't want to not have my family. I love them. It was just nice to have that little experience of freedom. And what happens in a lot of relationships is moms feel like their partners have more of that freedom than they do because they have to be the one to, let's say if they're nursing, they have to be available to nurse the baby or they have to be on a pumping schedule. 
or even if they're not nursing and they're formula feeding in most homes, the mom is the primary caretaker. And so their spouse like leaves for the day to work. And then sometimes they'll call and be like, oh, I'm going out for drinks for with the guys from work or whatever. And some, pa- some partners will be like, can I, some will just inform, but a lot of moms feel like their partner still has some of that freedom. And I was grateful that my husband like encouraged me to go experience that because he has experienced that freedom. Like in the summer we travel, we go away for the summer. So he travels back and forth for work. So during the week when he's away for work, he misses us. And he also has that for him, like once it's a full summer, he gets to the point where he just wants us to be back home. But he gets to experience that and he wanted me to experience that. And I was really grateful. And it was a very strange feeling after being a mom for so many years and never doing something like that. But that is one of the contributors where moms feel like they don't have this freedom that their partners have. And there are ways to work around that, even though I didn't have that experience till now when my oldest daughter is almost seven. I didn't have that resentment because we have other things that are supporting our relationship where I don't resent that, but it was an interesting and nice experience to have. So there's less time, there's less freedom, there's less flexibility, and there's less spontaneity than you were able to have before kids. You can't just go on like an impromptu date night. You have to think about who's going to watch the baby. Do you feel comfortable leaving the baby with somebody? How long are you able to be out? Does the baby have enough milk or whatever? Like there's so many more logistics to take care of. Logistically, your life is different. So those are just a few changes that naturally will impact a relationship. And they're so time consuming too. Just thinking about having to care for yeah. another little human that literally cannot do anything on their own. Yeah, a hundred percent. You made such a great point about like, you do kind of miss that freedom and they kind of do need it in a sense. Like my husband and I have come to an agreement of once a month, we each get a day off. I'm putting this in quotes because it's more of like half a day where like one person gets to go do whatever they want. If they want to just take a nap, that's fine. The other person's in charge and it just kind of gives each of us some time to recharge because otherwise you're just on, on, on. And right. So I guess I don't maybe have that, like, I didn't have that need for it as much as I got to enjoy it, but I didn't have that need for it because my two older ones are in school and my baby, we have a nanny because of work. So definitely that's not the same as a couple who has no help with their kids and their kids are not in school. Obviously that will be different. So that's, I guess it's just a disclaimer why it wasn't something I felt so much that I needed because I do get those little pieces in day-to-day life when I need to go do something. I don't have to drag a kid with me always. And a drag sounds like a strong word, but sometimes when you just need to go to the grocery store to pick up like two things, when you're with a kid, it's so much more mentally overwhelming, like than being able to just run into the store and out. So that was something that was nice about this week in a way where I was able to, if I needed to go get something, it was just like, just leave, go get it, go do it. Not worry about how long it's going to take me when I'm going to be back. So the, For couples who don't have that in day-to-day life in any way, obviously in those cases, it's going to lead to a little bit more needing it or wanting it or resentment. And in those cases, they can have an arrangement similar to you and your husband, where it's kind of like an agreement where you have some formal idea of how you're going to get that experience. I love that, that you, and you make the valid point about, yeah, every stage is different. So depending on the age, you're going to have to adjust to what works best for you. Yeah. So with all of that, how is a romantic relationship affected after a baby? Like we have the struggles, but then now what? (laughs) Hey, I'm Amanda German, host of the Honest as a Mother podcast. Join me every week to have an open and honest conversation about what motherhood is actually like. Let's ditch the perfect mom persona and let moms everywhere know that they're not alone. Listen each week on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah. So like we spoke about, there's the time. There's also the intimacy aspect, which we didn't even touch on. There's one that the mom physically is healing. There's the the mom many times like doesn't recognize herself, doesn't feel comfortable in her body and has to get used to it and is having this postpartum recovery and nursing. It's like, if you're nursing, you just feel like your body is not your own and it's doing this thing. And there's a baby on you all day. 
And a lot of moms get touched out. Moms get touched out from the actual sensation of being touched, of like the baby on them, touching them, eating and all that. But moms also get touched out or needed out or overstimulated just from needing to be on for people and people needing things from her and needing her to do things for them. And by the end of the day, she doesn't have much left to give and she doesn't want to give anything. And intimacy is a really important part of a relationship. And intimacy isn't only one thing. Intimacy isn't only sex. Most people like they hear, even when people hear what I do, I like, I help couples with their relationships after kids, their mind right away jumps there. And like, that's an important part of a relationship, but it's not the one and only part of a relationship. Intimacy is just talking. It's being open and vulnerable with each other. Sometimes though, when we're sleep deprived and we have a lot going on, then we don't take the opportunity to do that, to open up and just be there and connect. And then when we're not doing those parts of intimacy, there's even less of a desire to be physically intimate. And then physical intimacy, there's different ways of doing that, right? There's just, you know, cuddling, there's kissing, there's hugging, they're sitting near each other on the couch. So when I work with a mom who's struggling with this, and it's something that we get her to the point where like, she wants to want to touch her husband or be intimate and be feeling connected. So we take baby steps, even if it's just sitting near each other on the couch while they're watching something and just getting more comfortable with touch again, if they're feeling super touched out. So there's the intimacy aspect. There's a lack of time. There's less intentional connection. There's a lot of times complicated communication because people get frustrated within the communication. There is scorekeeping Like people say, I changed the baby X amount of times. You only changed the baby, whatever, or you didn't change the baby at all. Or I did this, I did that. Scorekeeping is never helpful for a relationship. You know, it's important to maybe have those discussions. If you feel like the load is completely unbalanced, it's important to have a discussion about that, but not, you know, in the, like in an aggressive or passive aggressive way, when you're in the moment of changing the diaper and annoyed, it's important to sit down and have that conversation. What we can talk about this and, you know, further on or jump into it a little bit now with a weekly check-in where we talk about what's going well in our relationship, in our home, what's not going so well in our relationship or home, how we want that to change and talking about any important things that the other person should know about that are coming up on the calendar, just so we could stay on the same page. So that's, really important to do with communication is just having that communication, not just assuming that the other person knows what's going on or knows what they have to do or knows what's on your mind or knows what's bothering you, because there might be things that they're doing that you don't notice and they don't notice everything you do. And I think that's also another reason why it can be helpful when like one person in a relationship gets to have a little bit of time off because then the other person has a greater appreciation for the things that person does. So true. So true. Right. It's kind of not out of my data yeah. but the opposite of it, where like you realize if I didn't have this person, then I wouldn't have all of these other things that they help yeah. me with. Yeah. I feel like you kind of already answered this question, but if you want to add anything more, like why do relationships struggle after a baby comes into the picture? We touched on that and the intimacy piece, feeling touched out, less time, sleep deprivation, and people not always being on the same page or being in sync with where they're at or what's going on for them. So after baby, let's say one of the big things is that the mom is often getting a lot more support. Like people are asking her, how are you doing? How's your recovery? And the dad's just kind of congratulations on becoming a dad. And they're just like coming here or coming to the mom and the dad's friends are not really involved. Men and women, we support each other in different ways. Men, you, there's this thing that men enjoy, let's say watching sports together because years ago they used to go hunting together and like they'd be side by side hunting. Whereas women like to talk because we would sit face to face with like our children as we taught them or we're cooking with them, doing different things with them. So we communicated more. And now it is important to communicate with each other. We don't live in caveman days where our our partners are out hunting all day and we're here just child rearing and homesteading, although that is uh, making a popular comeback right now on Instagram and TikTok. There's all these homesteader moms. And if that's the life that somebody wants to have, that's beautiful. And trad wives, there is a nice simplicity in that life, but 
when that's not a life that you chose or that you feel is aligned with how you want to be, then it feels like more of an obligation and something thrust upon you against your will, as opposed to something you willingly chose to do. There's all these like women who are saying, why did women fight for us to work? I don't want to work. I want to just be home having my babies. And the person's like, they fought to give you the right to choose whether you want to work or just be home with your babies. And even working moms, we're involved with our children and we each try to figure out a balance of what works for us. That's, you know, one of the reasons why I liked doing private practice, because if my daughter has a show in school, I can can't block out that day in my schedule so that I can be there for her show. Whereas if I had a nine to five, I'd have to put an approval for PTO. And then some moms don't even have that option. They, you know, have to work to support their families. And then all these different things like finances also impact a relationship after having a kid, because suddenly it's not just figuring out like a place to live and getting takeout. You have to provide for them, buy them clothes, buy them diapers. They're constantly changing sizes, you know, figuring out childcare. For a lot of people, you know, putting your kid in daycare can be as expensive as the, the amount of money you're making. So some moms literally go to work because they want to have an you know, area in their life where they're passionate about and are able to do something they enjoy. And they want to have a little break, so to speak, out of the house. So for them, it's worth it. Some people can't work because they can't afford the child care that they would need in order to work. So these things all then impact the relationship because it becomes an idea of why do you get to, why is it more my responsibility than your responsibility? There's all these questions that come up and in every situation, it's going to be different. So there's no, let's say one blanket suggestion for a couple, but my main suggestion is that communication is important. Getting on the same page is important. Hearing each other out is important. Understanding each other's needs, wants, desires is important. That doesn't mean you're always going to get everything you need or want. But if the person knows where you're coming from, they're able to meet you a little bit more than if they have no idea. The key, I guess, that I hear is really communication is a big, big part in order to really navigate these changes or these struggles. Yes. Yes. Are there any other (laughs) ways that couples can navigate these struggles that they start to see whether they, I guess the hard part is really when they start to recognize them, but what are, once they do recognize them, what can they do aside from communicating? So even not recognizing it, in addition to communication, connection, intentionally connecting is so important. And like I said before, one of the big challenges when you have a baby is that you can't be as spontaneous as you were before. So whereas when you're just two singles or even when you're married, but you don't have a baby, then if you want to go out to eat at night, like you just go out, like naturally you end up having this at least once a week, if not more of connection, because like you're eating your dinner together, you're doing different things together. You're together on the weekends and there's nobody who's coming in the morning to like climb into your bed and want your attention. There's nobody who you, one of you has to get up for while the other one still sleeps so that you can like give them breakfast or toys or entertain them. So when it's just the two of you, it's a lot easier to connect and you don't have that resentment that comes from you being the one to wake up with the kids and not them. So it's a totally different ball game. But when we have the baby connection doesn't just happen. We have to be very intentional about connection. We have to make sure and prioritize connection. And I'm not even talking about making sure you go out to a fancy dinner every week because in some stages of having children, that's just not possible. And that's okay. That's not the only way to connect. There are many ways to connect. And And it's also not always easier. Like I I don't find it enjoyable going out to dinner now. Right. Like, yeah, exactly. Like if you're just not feeling it, you're not in the mood. That's not the only way to connect. There's plenty of ways to connect. And it's important to just make that connection happen and figure out ways that work for your life. If you're going to really move mountains to do a certain thing that you feel you need to do. It just doesn't fit organically into your life in any way. Then it's not going to happen often because it's just not as enjoyable when it's not seamless or easy to do. So if you can figure out like pockets in your life where you can make it a habit to connect, that's going to transform your relationship in so many ways, because every time that we connect, we make a deposit into our emotional bank account with each other. 
every time that we have friction or conflict or feel resentment, we make a withdrawal from our emotional bank account. So there's constantly withdrawals and deposits happening in our lives. Naturally, when you have more stress in your life, there will be more withdrawals than when you don't have stress in your life. And having a kid is a beautiful blessing. It's a beautiful, amazing thing. And it's a miracle to have a healthy baby. It's also a new stressor in your life. It's something that demands more of your energy, more of your time, more of your brain power, limits you in certain ways you weren't limited before. So it's a huge blessing and it's also a stressor. So when we're going through something stressful, there is naturally going to be more withdrawals than when there isn't. So raising a child has different stressors and each stage of raising a child has different stressors. So in the beginning, you're sleeping less. Then you finally figure out the sleeping and eating part, hopefully, but they're now climbing through everything in your house and destroying things and like wreaking havoc. Hey mamas, today's episode is a two-part series. Unfortunately, we've reached the end of part one, but don't worry, there's more to come next week. Tune in for part two, where we'll continue our amazing conversation. Thank you for listening. Tune in next week for our next episode. You can find us on Instagram for more updates and tips. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts and give us a review if you like us.